Hi everyone, welcome back to AI News, AI Baodao. I'm here again with these two amazing gentlemen. I'm just spending the day with him and I'm just impressed and impressed. It's like, uh, that's the pastor that I've been looking for. <laughs> and then uh, their goal, their way, and then their thing, they're, not, they're bold. They just go out and do things. I wish that like, every pastor had your courage to do something. And then that brings it to today's topic. Oh, before I do that, can you guys uh, introduce yourself again? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want to go? I'm, I'm uh, Reverend Troy Newman. I'm president of Operation Rescue, and I've been in full-time ministry for about 32 years and had the privilege to preach the gospel and preach in churches and preach around the world, actually. Uh, and it's been my great pleasure to do that and to be here with you. Troy's very modest. Troy runs the leading pro-life organization, I think, in the world, but definitely in the nation that's done as much or more than anybody's ever done for the pro-life movement. Why don't you just tell them your, your latest little, uh, little dust up with Planned Parenthood. So uh, maybe the viewers remember uh, a few years back, we released some videos of Planned Parenthood abortionists discussing the sale of baby body parts. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and so that was our organization. Uh, it's funded the Center for Medical Progress. I, I founded that organization. And, Consequently, they took us to trial and uh, they found us all guilty of racketeering, and unfair business practices in a liberal courtroom in San Francisco. And so I owe Planned Parenthood about $18 million. Uh, oh. But uh, I, be, be rest assured that we caused them much more than $18 million in damage. <laughs> and I'm very proud of that. And it really just exposed who they are. And when you get the evil people talking on camera, uh, when they think they're only talking to themselves, they were very unguarded and truthful. It's it's only when they get up on the screen in front of CNN that they lie. Yeah. Oh, and we caught the one abortion doctor doing negotiating basically a felonious act, the sale of baby body parts. It is a felony, but she was just concerned as long as she got her Lamborghini, she didn't really want to get into all the details. We have her on record. It's yeah. and Troy's organization led the way. And just who I am, I'm Pastor Gary Cass. I'm the new pastor of Christ Community Reformed Church in Escondido. And uh, we I've been serving the Lord for 45 years. Wow, to think about it. But uh, I've been in ordained ministry since 1985 and uh, have pastored. And I did lead uh, an organization called the Center for Reclaiming America for Christ. I uh, was the executive director. Some of you may know Dr. D. James Kennedy from Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. Um, he was one of the most instrumental uh, leaders in the culture uh, for, for decades. And so uh, I ran his public policy ministry. And now I'm, I become the pastor of this church and very excited to be here. I actually, I know a pastor and then it was during election time, and then I was like, "Oh no, no, no don't you don't vote, vote for Joe Biden? He's killing babies." Mm -hmm. And then uh, the the pastor uh, hate Trump for mm -hmm. some reason. I don't know. And then he's like, "Oh," and then I talked to him, and he's like, "I'm I'm pro choice, a pastor." And I'm like, "How could you be pro choice if you're a pastor?" And I start this argument, mm -hmm. and of course I won the argument, but he's like. I'm a pastor. I go to this this seminar, this, uh, seminary, and then uh, I, I I I was ordained by this this pastor. Da, da, da. And I'm like, oh, I hope your degree helped you. <laughs> so so obviously not. <laughs> you know, one of the things that I did in my first several years of full time ministry is I spent half my time meeting with pastors like that. Mm. I had a little TV, you know, the old CRT came out of a box like this and a little cassette tape that went in there and I would put it on their desk and I'd press play and it was a seven minute video called The Hard Truth. Mm. And you can still look it up on YouTube now, Hard Truth video, and it was pictures of aborted babies, what happens during an abortion. And after five or six or seven mm. years of debating with these pastors that said they were in favor of abortion, yeah. I took all my arguments and I wrote them down in a book called Their Blood Cries Out that shows biblically from Genesis to Revelation yeah. that the killing of innocent babies, all human beings, is antithetical to God's law and is a direct sin and violation against God Almighty and His image bearers. Hmm. So, and that's always been the legacy of the church. Right. <laughs> Wherever Christianity has gone and been accepted, life becomes sacred. Yeah. And we're, unfortunately now, we're not in some progressive movement. We're in a 
degressive movement. We're going back to paganism. And that's one of the things, you know, that I wish we could have talked about at the university. All of these universities, who do you think started the universities? The Christians. Christians yeah. <laughs> who do you think thought too. girls and women should be able to be educated as well? It was Christians. Yeah. And, uh, and yet, when we go on the campus, well, you saw what happened. We were there preaching the gospel on, on the campus of the university, and you were there. It was mostly strident women yeah. who were most uh, vocal about, you know, we had no right to be there. So, um, so we've got a lot of work to do. And again, kind of a one-liner, it took Christians to give us this country and our liberties. Yeah. It's going to take Christians to regain them. Yeah. And the Christians need shepherds. And so the pastors have to lead the way. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, uh, there's a kind of a, a view of, of time and history and the future that tends to undermine that. And, um, you know, when, I, when I'm teaching my church, we don't take some real strong position on end times. But what most people don't know, there's arguably 13 views of end times that I would say that falls within the pale of Christian orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. um, we all agree Christ will return in judgment yeah. and all views end in that, in what's called the consummation. And we all agree that everybody will have personal eschatology. Everyone will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. If, if you're a Christian, you'll be, you'll be at the white throne judgment if you're not a Christian. But everyone will have personal judgment and we believe in the return of Christ. All views of eschatology mm -hmm. agree on those two things. Everything else is kind of speculative. Mm -hmm. And everybody that's tried to come up with the perfect view of end times has been proven wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, they've made predictions and they've never come to pass. And so I kind of, a, a little while ago, kind of came to some different conclusions. And I, I think that it's uh, as much practical and pragmatic, although you shouldn't get your theology from pragmatism. Um, but if, if I get up in the morning and in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I'm going to get up, I'm going to preach the gospel, I'm going to stand for Jesus, I'm going to do everything that the Bible commands me to do, but it's not really going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, you will self-sabotage. Yes. And the more I thought about it, how does that comport with what we read in the New Testament about the victory of Jesus? Mm -hmm. uh, it says, had the, world, had the principalities and powers... Had they known what was going on at the cross, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. Yeah. Because that was their death nail. Yeah. The crucifixion, resurrection of Jesus Christ, and then the sending of the Holy Spirit to the church to fill the whole earth with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. That is our call. Mm -hmm. And that's what the church has, has believed through church history up until about 150 years ago. Some, some novel ideas came up in America, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of them are still prevalent, but at the end of the day, practically, what does it teach? Everything has to get worse so that Jesus can come back. Yeah, that's, so if that's I believe like, that, why yeah. would I go stand in front of an abortion clinic and try to keep babies from getting murdered? Yeah, Shouldn't I, think, I be glad, actually? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of, actually, a lot of a Christian who think that. They go like, I'm actually helping the world by not doing anything Correct. because... Uh, it's, it's like eugenic. It's like I'm helping the world so uh, Jesus can come and judge us. I'm actually speeding up this process. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I don't know how, but I think it, that idea is definitely wrong. No, it's not just wrong. That's the, <laughs> it, we call that the doctrines of demons because we're the salt and the light. So if we stop being salt and light, who can be the salt and light? Right. Mm. It's also very easy to take that position. Exactly. It's the, it's the lazy man's position. You don't have to do anything. Right. Uh, and then it leads to more of a Gnosticism or a Neo-Gnosticism where everything is spiritual. The whole gospel's inside your head. Uh, it's in church maybe, but outside there, it, it, we don't have anything to do with it. There is a famous preacher uh, that died 
I don't know, 30 years ago, Dr. Uh, J. Vernon McGee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's still on the radio, through the Bible radio, and he would teach that you don't polish brass on a sinking ship, speaking of the Titanic. You're not polishing mm -hmm. brass as it's going down. And basically, you don't try to clean up the world because it's all going to burn any time. Don't try to preach against uh, any social evils, but go ahead and just preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. And uh, that does nothing uh, for the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who are perishing. Yeah. We're just letting them die. Imagine a building burning down. You said, well, it's better anyway. They're going to go to heaven. I've literally had pastors tell me, well, it's better that ab abortions uh, happen because more babies in heaven. All babies go to heaven. So the more uh, abortions that happen, we're filling up heaven with babies. It's the most despicable. What? I've heard mm -hmm. there's a many, many pastors that believe that. And when I first heard it, I just I, I was blown away. I, I, I was dumbfounded and awestruck. How could anyone believe this? But many people believe that, and, and nothing could be further from the truth. Wow. One of the great uh, truths we were just looked at a couple weeks ago in our church, um, and I encourage you pastors to go and, and look it up. It was the historic ancient church that had a view. They called it Christos Victor. Uh -huh. And because of these passages we read in the New Testament, where Christ has triumphed over powers and principalities, making a public spectacle of them on the cross, mm -hmm. that he is redeeming all things unto himself, things seen and un unseen, that Christ is at work. And he did ascend to the Father's right hand, and all authority in heaven and on earth was given to the Son. And now in his name we are to go in his authority to bring his claims as king of kings to the earth. And they're comprehensive and exhaustive claims. There's no part of this world that Christ is unconcerned about. But when we talk about, for example, the abortion issue, the reason that's such a focus is because it's so clearly evil and wicked and a violation of everything that Christ came for. So if we're not willing to stand up against the, the worst and most evil thing, um, what, what good are we? We're not here just to get saved. Uh, we're to do justice. We're commanded to do justice. Well, what does that look like? Well, it's what the Bible says justice yeah. is. Yeah. And uh, that Operation Rescue is founded on that whole premise mm -hmm. that we're going to rescue those who are perishing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that you guys have brought up some, so many important points for the church. Because if... It's God's plan that this world becomes so wicked and then uh, everyone's going to die and then uh, the whole, every city is going to burn. He, he wouldn't rescue Moses. Mm -hmm. you know, it would start at the end, in the beginning. Right. It would just stop right there. Then the whole world just go like, yeah, just, just, even Noah, it would just end it right there. Right. Yeah. So I think it's selfish. Yes. It's selfish and so, so self-centered to think that somehow me and my generation are so special that God has stopped his work today yeah. or in a week or a year or something like that. Everything, the whole culmination of 6,000 years stops now and he has no plan for the next generation or a hundred generations ahead. Yeah. It's all done. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, it's very selfish uh, of people and pastors to think that and not think that we must lay the foundation for this church with a cornerstone and build this church in so far as in a thousand years from now, it will stand as a testimony to Christ and impact the world so that it is more conforming every day to the gospel of Jesus Christ and yeah. to his law and order. When you look back in history, if let's just say they stopped uh, you know, a thousand years ago. What mm -hmm. would the world look like mm -hmm. then if we stopped trying to impact the world? Or 500 years ago. Uh, today, there's no... Uh, in a sense, generational slavery mm -hmm. like we had in the United States. Actually, all over the world. For 6,000 years, there was generational slavery. And who yeah. stopped that, by the way? It was Christians that oh, stopped yeah, that's that. That's right. <laughs> uh, the advent of medicine to take dominion over the world and say... And who started that? Uh, it was Christians. Okay. Uh, to, to create things out. like penicillin or, or uh, vaccines for polio and so forth to say, let's make human race better. Let's devote the next 10, 20, 30 years of our lives Look at agriculture. Even 50, 60 years ago, most people used plows and horses. Now we have these great combines and tractors and one man can farm tens of thousands of acres and feed tens of thousands of people. 
it's getting better all the time. Where the original advent or uh, commandment to the human race is be fruitful and multiply yes. and subdue the earth. We're doing that. Mm -hmm. Now he says, go to the nations, disciple them, and teach them all things I have commanded you. Those are symbiotic things. Mm -hmm. And look forward and stop looking and thinking you're so special in the, in the whole world economy. Billions and billions of people, the whole world economy, that it's all going to stop here. Somehow we're so special, we're going to see the return of Christ. Maybe it's true. Mm -hmm. But you know what? They told me that when I was this big. Now I'm an <laughs> older man. Planning. And they told my mother, and you told your mother, who, who died uh, what ten years ago at ninety five when she was that big. Yes, <laughs> and so now I have children, and I have grandchildren, and maybe ten or fifteen years I have great grandchildren, and and God says a righteous man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Mm -hmm. I don't want to just leave an inheritance of money or wealth to them. I want to leave them a country that is better off then than it is today. We need to fight the battles and slay the demons that rear their head in our generation so that that generation can, can live more comfortably. Now, I think it's uh, such an important message because uh, recently I just watched the news. Vladimir Putin had a speech mm -hmm. accusing the West about how evil we are. Our kids don't know if they're men or women, women or students don't know what they're doing, fought for the wrong thing and just how evil the West is. You know, he was, he used to run the KGB. Yeah. So he doesn't really have the moral high ground. Yeah, but what he said is actually the truth about right. our society today. Does America still have a chance to Absolutely. fight back? And then uh, does American Christians still can gain control of our country and our righteousness? Yeah, absolutely. And, but here's the truth. Nations come and nations go. Uh, the Bible says nations are a drop in the bucket to God. Yes. It's not really about the nation. Although I love America, I love my nation, I want to see it thrive, I want to see everybody blessed. And frankly, I do believe uh, you, you've heard the doctrine of American exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. And basically what that means is it's not that we're exceptional because of who we are per se. We have benefited the most from the result of Christians thinking about justice and law mm -hmm. and all of these things, we just happened to inherit it. Had it not been for a dream yeah. that the Apostle Paul had yeah. to go to Macedonia, he was going east with the gospel. And the east would be way ahead of us because they would have had the gospel long, longer and the effects of the gospel would have transformed and changed their culture. But God and his providence said, no, you need to go west. And so the West had the benefit of the influence of the gospel of Christ, and we are the ones that inherited it primarily through our Puritan forefathers, uh, who I think in many ways are still the high water mark of Christian maturity. And we benefited from all of their thinking about what does the Bible say about justice? What does the Bible say about government? All of that. And we inherited that. Now, unfortunately, we've squandered it. Yeah. But the, the good news is we know where to go to find it again. Mm -hmm. And it's right there in the scriptures. We have a great patrimony. And as culture starts to implode, because Jesus says, if you don't build your, your life on me, you're building it on sand, it's going to, the storms are going to come and it, things that can be shaken will be shaken. Today mm -hmm. at, the, at the university, I was telling them, look, you guys, all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. all of them. Mm -hmm. for, for government, for science, for everything, it, when you forsake Christ, you go into insanity. We have the gospel. And so we need a revival, mm -hmm. the, but we have our Bibles. We have a great patrimony, I, uh, and we don't deserve God's mercy. We've killed 60 million preborn babies. God has every right to judge us, but we're praying for God's mercies. And the good news is we've got the goods. We don't have to go back to square one. Mm -hmm. yeah. We just have to reclaim our patrimony that we've inherited. You look, there's 185 nations around the world. There's only one nation that understands that rights come down from God and are given to men. And it's government's job to protect those rights mm. from intrusions and from abuse. No other country has that. And I love to talk to people from Canada or Europe or France especially, <laughs> and they don't understand our system of government because they don't understand that rights come from God. And as long as we can hold on to that, we have the right to free speech, the right to defend ourselves, the right to a, a judicial system uh, or a justice system. Uh, 
we, we have so many rights that are inherent, the right to practice religion. So we just need to pray and work and rely on the foundation that our fathers that gave us this country. So there's still a lot of hope, but really it's going to be the grace of God. Yeah, I, I think that I want to point this out. The reason I ask this question is because many of our viewer, when, when I say the number 60 million babies got killed in the United States, they're like, oh, United States, it's so evil. Oh, it's mm -hmm. more evil than the Chinese Communist uh, Party. Oh, how uh, many? They killed <laughs> and I'm like, I want to stress this. They are still killing babies. At least we're fighting for it. At least we're fighting for babies' life. Mm -hmm. At least America is doing the right thing. At, at least America is stop slavery. Mm -hmm. At least America is doing the right thing to build family. That's all the other country on, right. in the world are not doing anything. Really. You know why that is? Look at the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. In the Declaration of Independence, that's a theological document. Mm -hmm. Yes, Our rights come from God, and we're supposed to govern ourselves according to the laws of nature and of nature's God. So we have, if you will, in our spiritual DNA, we have a very strong theistic, if not a Christian, it, it assumed a Christian worldview and appealed to a Christian worldview, and that's what gave birth to our nation. I still pray and I still believe there's enough Americans that intuitively know that that's right. Yes. And that we can appeal to that, and we will appeal to that, because it, it is true. And it is the basis of our social contract. We've got to start somewhere, and we got to realize our rights come from God. The Constitution was written to put shackles mm -hmm. on the on government, government, to keep them from taking away what we know are our God-given rights and to limit government so that we could have maximum freedoms because we believe that we can trust people with freedom. We don't need a bureaucrat or the state to control us. God is sovereign. God governs the world according to his covenants. So he blesses those who obey him. He judges those who disobey him. And we can trust God and his justice to be able to mete out justice in that sense. I don't need a bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. We can trust God. And then that creates the environment for the maximum amount of freedom. But now we have in humanism, they don't believe in God. So someone has to be in control and it'll be them. Thank you very much. And they're going to tell you everything. You know, you shouldn't probably have a gas stove. I mean, it gets down to absurd levels of trying to be God that's unsustainable. And we've seen in history what happens every time humanists have tried to do this. It becomes the most murderous enterprise in history. Yeah, every time when communist ideologic person got in power, it just automatically turned into fascism. Just start killing their own citizen, mm -hmm. secret police and everything. And I believe that's happening in the United States as well with the FBI thing, mm -hmm. with yes. the CIA thing, with the ATF trying to take our gun, pistol brace. Do you see us Christian fighting uh, the government? Well, no, I no, not in the civil war, you mean, type thing? No, uh, no, 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 no not, okay. not civil war, but ideologic well, war. Well, no. If anything, we're just calling back, hey, just give us back our constitutional yeah. rights. <laughs> but see, it, it, President Lincoln uh, coined a term that said uh, in his second inaugural address that it's we the people, by the people, for the people. Mm -hmm. It's correct. Our government. Yes. Those people in Washington, D.C. work for us. Yes. Again, this is the only country in the world that's like this. Those are our employees. They think they are our overlords. They yes. think they are our masters. But we have laws in place to say that they are not. Samuel Rutherford wrote a classic document, Lex Rex, which means the law is king, not Rex Lex, where the king is law. Mm -hmm. Here, the law is king. We, we hear the politicians say, no man is above the law. That's correct, including them who say that. So we must take back our country, and that's built into our founding documents to use the word fight the government, or I say resist the government, but we must continually purify the government from the people who would want to make, be kings themselves. Mm -hmm. It's built into our constitution to recycle these people and get mm -hmm. them out. So there is a battle ahead. I don't believe it's going to come to you know, guns and so forth. I sure hope not. So that's my prayer. Mm -hmm. It will yeah. not. The so-called insurrection day on January 6th. It's interesting that <laughs> nobody there was carrying guns except the police. We were all peacefully redressing the government 
for their crimes and yes. for their problems. Now, they haven't fixed that, but we the people are going to fix that mm -hmm. in mass. And mm -hmm. I think there's enough good Americans, people of goodwill that see what's going on and are saying, mm -hmm. we don't want to live in a communist country. We don't want to live in a country like Canada or Mexico or Great Britain or the CCP or any place else. We want to live in America where we have our rights and we can be free. Even our founders said, this idea of liberty that they bequeathed to us said, this has to be given to people who are moral, in other words, yes. self-control. Yeah. John Adams. Yeah, so yeah. we need self-control. The Holy Spirit gives us the fruit of self-control. So we need Christians living self-controlled life so that we can have as much liberty as possible. And we've abandoned that. And so the only alternative is state control. Mm -hmm. And so we're coming with a, just a simple message. Jesus wants to be Lord of your life. Family government needs to conform to the scriptures. Church government needs to conform to the scriptures. And civil government needs to. And by the way, all those forms of government under God are limited. Mm -hmm. For example, even with self-government, can I murder myself? I don't have the right even to take my own life. I belong to God. As a father, do I have the right to abuse my children? Does God give me that right? No, he doesn't. As an elder and a pastor in the church, do I have the right to abuse my flock? Absolutely not. And no civil magistrate then has been given unlimited authority to be able to do whatever they want to do. Remember the British idea was the divine right of kings. Yeah. And that's what the whole glorious revolution in England, which was the precursor to our revolution, was all about that there are limits on the kings and our rights don't come from them and the kings have to obey God and his law just like everybody else. Magna Carta, right? Oh, yeah. Magna Carta, Lex Rex, which gave us Cromwell. the Bill of Rights, which <laughs> ultimately gave us the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Amazing history. Yeah, it all goes back to Geneva and Calvin in Geneva. So all roads go there. So yeah, we'd like to make a new Geneva here, <laughs> seriously. That should be the passion of every pastor, to see God's will done in our city. Yes. And it's not God's will that we see children sex trafficked. Uh, it's not God's will that we see uh, babies aborted. Uh, we need to make every city a new Geneva under Christ. Amazing interview today. I've learned so much. Seriously, it, it, from my personal point, it, it's like it gave me more hope in this country because I think this country is it really needs to wake up to the gospel. I think every Christian needs to start reading his or her Bible. I think that's the mm -hmm. biggest problem. Yes. Christians don't read their Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, they expect pastor to tell them what to do. And then sometimes pastors are confused themselves too. Christians need to wake up and then read their Bible and then uh, hit the book. Ask God, what is your purpose? What God want you to do? And then I think that will definitely save the country and then uh, make the country point in the right direction. I think things have shifted a little bit, and, I, and this is, I think, the, the most current question for every pastor. Uh, I don't know, if, Troy, you remember, back in the 80s, there was this whole battle in evangelicalism about the inerrancy and authority of Scripture. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, most evangelical churches will have a high view of Scripture, affirm its infallibility and inspiration. And they give lip service to it, and I, I do believe they're sincere, but when it comes to the sufficiency of scripture. What I see is the pastors going to the world and looking to the world and secularism and worldly sources, sometimes very wicked, vicious, unbelieving sources like Darwin or Freud or Kinsey or some, and we're getting our ideas about gender yeah. and sexuality from people who hate God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And do we believe that the Bible is sufficient to be able to give us what we need to be able to minister to the world? And I would like to see pastors get a renewed sense of, hey, God has made you the steward of the, of the mysteries of God. He's given you the scriptures and we're desperate for leadership. And, you know, we've deferred to the experts and what have the experts done? Now I saw a poll today. It used to be 3% of people in America would identify as homosexuals. It was never higher than 3%. This, there was a whole lie going around 10%. That It's never been that way. Um, today in a Gallup poll, it came back 7.2% of people now identify as LGBTQ. Well, what's the difference? 30 years of propaganda. Yeah. They've been grooming our kids 
There's no other word for it. And now our kids are growing up morally and sexually confused, and we haven't been there to, to articulate the truth. So pastor, it's now or never, it's, it, now's the time. Mm -hmm. You've got the word. Is it really sufficient? Do, do we really believe that we have the word of God and that we can speak to these issues with more authority than anybody else? Because we have the word of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we need to. Amen. So my last word would be, folks, uh, go to your iPhone and go to that section on your iPhone where it shows how much time you spend on different areas. How much time did you spend in your email? How much time did you spend on Twitter? How much time did you spend on Facebook? Okay, take that time, cut it in half, and spend that much time every day in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Read your Bible every day, every day. Read the whole Bible in a year and do it again and again. And you will be more wise than all of your peers. And you'll be able to disciple the nations. And you'll be able to teach the infidels, the foolish people, the pagans, what is right and what is wrong. And you will look like a well springing with wisdom and knowledge. And the whole people will, like Solomon, they'll come to you looking for answers in their times of trouble. Be that person. And uh, God will use you. We'll clap for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you for letting us be here. <laughs> no, it's your church. What an amazing interview. It's so honored to know both of you and then such men of God teaching young generation of uh, Christian how to live our life and how to find a purpose. And there is so many purpose right now. There, there is a lot of people who's like, I don't know what to do with church. I don't know what to do with my Christian life. I don't know the Seriously, go outside, look at the world, you'll see so many problems. Mm -hmm. Everything you look at should be prey on. Mm -hmm. And then especially if you're in California, don't say something like, I don't know what to do with my life. I don't know what to do as a Christian. Just go outside and then uh, find the nearest abortion center and just pray over it. And go to Operation Rescue's website. If abortion is your issue, there's no better place to go. You need to get Troy's book, Abortion-Free Communities. It's the Holy Spirit that will lead, but there's no reason to have to start from scratch. You can learn from our experiences and our mistakes and our successes, but things are you know, changing all the time. And I would say start what's closest. Yeah. Pick something. I think your idea is so good. All right, everyone, thank you guys for watching. It's been an amazing interview. I've learned so much. I hope you guys do the same. And then uh, if you have any question, comment, please leave it on the bottom. And then uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>